Hey everyone, for this video I've decided to put something together that's a little bit shorter than my build guides and something that I think a number of players could maybe benefit from as not all of this is super well explained in the game. I'm going to be covering the stats, how they work, and what they really contribute. Some of these may seem pretty obvious or straightforward, but some of them not so much. Obviously, to start with, we have the four basic stats here. Vitality, hit points, armor, action points. I won't go into too much detail here as the game does a pretty good job of explaining all four of these. Just have a couple quick things I'm gonna mention though. For vitality, obviously, if this reaches zero, you die. The lower it gets, the more injuries you take. Now, the primary way to recover your vitality is through the hospice building, the first building you have to build in the game. That's obvious. However, there are a couple other ways you can restore vitality that the game just kind of leaves up to you to find. First, there's an upgrade you can get th that will regenerate vitality on your characters after the end of each mission. This is a building upgrade. However, at the time of this recording, this was bugged. This upgrade was bugged for me, at least. Um, it has been brought to their attention, and they did say they plan to fix this soon. Alternatively from that, there is also gear that you can get that will restore vitality at the end of a mission for whoever has this piece of gear equipped. This can be fairly useful, especially in the early game. And lastly, there are shrines. These shrines can restore vitality to a singular character that you choose to bestow it on and they are spread out amongst the different missions. There's, there's a bit of RNG to what the shrines will grant you and sometimes you may find one when your party is completely full. Remember where that shrine is so that way by the time the end of the mission comes around maybe you have taken some vitality damage you can go back grab it heal your injured character and then end the mission. The last thing on these four basic stats I want to mention is action points. Action points, obviously, that's what you use to cast your abilities and move around on the battlefield on a given turn. There's an additional one, however, called Movement AP that gets introduced pretty early on. And you can get this from gear and some skill points on certain classes. Movement AP, as the name suggests, can only be used for movement. But what it doesn't tell you is that when you have movement AP, this will get consumed first when you are moving. The game does this so that way you can try and prioritize as much of the regular AP for your actions and abilities. Additionally, as you also learn fairly early on in combat, you can end your turns prematurely, essentially pass, and let some of your leftover AP carry over into your next turn so you can do extra stuff on the following turn. Movement AP does not calculate into this. So if you have one AP and like five movement AP and you end your turn, only that one regular AP will carry over in the reserves to your next turn. Getting to the stats over here. The game actually does give a decent breakdown for each of these, but if you're like me and didn't think to ever bother mousing over them to read them, uh, you're not alone. There's a number of other players I've ran into and discussed with that have had questions about how these work simply because they just didn't think to try and read them, so hopefully I can explain these pretty well and offer a little more insight into how they work beyond what even the game will tell you with these descriptions. We're going to start at the top here with weapon damage. Now weapon damage is more than just how much damage you do when you physically strike them with the weapon. All offensive skills calculate their damage as a percentage of what this number is. Whether it be something physical, like a strike, shield charge, or something magical that doesn't technically use the weapon, like a thunderbolt or chain lightning. All of these calculate how much damage they do based off whatever number is shown right here. So simply put, the higher this number, the higher damage all of your moves, abilities, spells, whatever, are going to be doing. Next up we have armor breaking. Armor breaking is pretty simple, but calculating it can become a bit more complicated when you get more and more bonuses stacking onto it, whether it be through gear, skills, and even an essence that can increase this. To put it simply, 
Mordred here is going to be a nice easy example. Mordred does 20 damage under ordinary circumstances without status conditions, buffs, etc. He does 20 damage. His armor breaking is 10%. So this means that when he hits an enemy f f with strike, for example, as that's just 100% weapon damage, so when he strikes them for 20 damage, they will lose 2 armor. The next stat is block. Block is a stat that is only relevant to defenders on your end, or to shield-bearing enemies for the opponents you're going to be going against. Block is a flat damage negation to frontal attacks. So if the enemy is attacking from the side or from behind, getting a backstab, this stat will be completely irrelevant. For frontal attacks, however, a block of 50% means that Mordred will be taking half of the damage from any frontward facing attack. This new damage is then calculated against the armor value, and if the new damage value is below the armor value, the attack can actually deal zero damage. So if I attack normally, it is going to be dealing 40 damage, but it's coming from the front, so it gets blocked. The new damage is only 20. Well, 20 is going to be below Mordred's armor of 33, so he'll take zero damage. Now, he may have some armor breaking, as we covered before, and even though it does zero damage, it can still break off some armor. Physical debuff resist and mental debuff resist. Debuffs have a flat 100% effectiveness, essentially, when they're cast on a target. Once cast, the target's resistances are then calculated against this 100% to then give a new value to this debuff that was used. So in this case, Mordred has 107% physical debuff resist. This means that any physical debuff cast on him is completely negated, because 100% minus 100% leaves it at 0%. This extra 7% doesn't do anything. For his mental debuff resist, he has 60%. So this means any mental type debuffs cast on him will only have 40% of their normal potency. So for example, if an enemy spellcaster places a damage over time effect on him that does 10 damage per turn, instead it will only be doing 4, because the 100% minus the 60%, leaving that 40% potency, 4 is 40% of 10. Here we have Spellcraft, and Spellcraft is not a combat stat. As you're playing through missions, you can find various shrines dotted along throughout them, as I mentioned before for the vitality healing. They can offer other benefits such as buffs or even debuffs on your party. These shrines all have hidden spellcraft values to determine whether you get to know what they're going to do before you agree to it. As you progress through the game, these totems and their hidden spellcraft values will get higher and higher. So if you want to keep knowing what these shrines will do, you want to make sure you bring a character that has a decent spellcraft stat. Additionally, there are hidden chests on some levels that can be spotted if you get close enough if you have a character present within your party that has a high enough spellcraft to match this chest hidden spellcraft value. Perception is similar to spellcraft, but it does, however, have some combat usefulness. Perception in combat will determine the range at which your characters can spot hidden enemies or traps. This will let you more easily navigate around them and avoid extra damage or in many cases a slow debuff, and also reveal enemy units before they get the chance to get an ambush attack on you for some extra damage. Outside of combat, it can also reveal extra hidden loot chests. Now, the hidden loot chests that are spotable through perception are different from the ones that are spotable through spellcraft. If you want to get every single loot chest possible that may be hidden from you on a mission, you'll need a perception character and a spellcraft character. One will not be able to do both. Hex Intensity is an Arcanist-only stat. Arcanists have their own debuff spells called Hexes. Each of these Hexes has a base value of how much they will debuff the target, shown in pink in the ability descriptions. Hex Intensity will increase these effects with 100% Hex Intensity, meaning that the debuff will be twice as strong. So for example, 
death hex will now be causing 60% vitality loss, where a 50% hex intensity means that death hex would be causing a 45% vitality loss. Your hex intensity calculations will not be reflected on the character sheets. As you can see, this is showing only 30% despite my plus 91% hex intensity on this Morgana. But once you are in combat, this will reflect the actual correct value that it will apply to your enemies. Lastly are injury tokens. When your heroes take vitality damage, they will suffer an injury. The percentage of the missing vitality when they take the hit doesn't determine how many injuries they take, just the severity. There are minor and major injuries, essentially a debuff or a worse debuff. Injuries are applied on a per hit basis, not how much damage you take. So a hit of 10 damage or a hit of 50 damage will both apply one injury, assuming this is coming from one singular attack. An injury token, however, acts as a shield and will prevent the injury from being applied to your character and be consumed in the process. The number of tokens the character has will determine how many hits they can take before injuries begin to apply. So for example, here we have Mordred with four injury tokens. This means he can take four hits to his vitality before he will suffer any injuries. And that covers all the different stats within King Arthur Knight's Tale. I hope you found this video useful and maybe learned something from it. I do have another video planned to go over some tips and advice for your newly started campaigns and help ensure you have the strongest start possible. I do plan to have that out soon in the next couple days. Uh, aside from that, I'm still going to be making build guide videos and trying to keep those coming out at around one a day for now. But yeah, that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching.